Welcome to our service of Sun Morning Prayer today. Blessings to you wherever you are, and we're so glad that you can join us as we come to hear God's Word and to worship our God together. If you have a, uh, a 1982 hymnal, our opening hymn is Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, and that's hymn number 522. Or you can find it on the first page of your bulletins. <laughs> Yes. 
restore them, those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and Merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouths shall be all thy praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase and, in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pethon and Ramesses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed upon them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all of his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take the child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. 
She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Thanks be to God. Uh, Psalm is Psalm 124 and found on page 781 in your Book of Common Prayer or on page 3 in our bulletins.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philip, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. The story of Joseph in Egypt is a classic immigrant's tale. Even more so because Joseph arrived as a slave, yet rose to become prime minister of all Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh himself. The story is set during a period in Egyptian history when the traditional Egyptian pharaohs had been displaced by foreign Semitic rulers known as the Hyksos. They would have had much in common with Joseph and his brothers and father who later joined him. Egypt eventually drove out the Hyksos, restoring the old ruling class and pharaohs who knew not Joseph. But perhaps it's more accurate to say that they did not appreciate what Joseph's people, the Israelites, had done for Egypt. Much of Egypt's power grew out of having a strong labor force. Unfortunately, Egyptians were famously ethnocentric. History does confirm that. Even though the Israelites had lived in the land for four centuries, they were and always would be foreigners. The idea that they might become fully Egyptian partners, sharing fairly in the benefits of what they had built, never even enters Pharaoh's mind. Instead, he saw their growing numbers as an existential threat. Thus began the oppression of the Israelites in which Pharaoh worked to repress these outsiders. The usual tedious tactics of overwork and oppression backfired, making the situation worse until, in desperation, they resorted to male infanticide for Israelite newborns. This was the setting of Moses' birth and infancy. The nativity of Moses follows what scholars call the abandoned hero motif. The hero, as an infant, is abandoned or under threat, but somehow rescued by fate or divine intervention. There are many examples, Oedipus, Remus and Romulus, Perseus and others. These narratives of endangerment and rescue, however, have a predictive quality about them. They foreshadow the hero's later life and accomplishments. With this in mind, consider how the infancy narrative of Moses describes the acts of women who, each in their own way, evaded, subverted, or defied unjust power. Moses' mother, Yoshebel, managed to hide Moses for three months before consigning him to the Nile. The thing is that, technically, she obeyed the edict by putting the baby in the river, but Pharaoh's edict never prohibited the use of flotation devices. 
her defiance was quiet, more in line with the power available to someone of her station. She found a way to obey the letter of the law while flouting its intent. Later on, with some help from her quick-witted daughter, she not only manages to nurse her own son, she gets paid to do it. Now consider the midwives, upon whom fell the task of carrying out Pharaoh's barbarous decree. In the ancient Near East, midwifery was one of the few professions that was entirely the domain of women. The midwives seem to have used this professional boundary to rebuff Pharaoh. Their excuse about the liveliness of Hebrew women in childbirth notwithstanding, aside from the snide connotations about Egyptian women, they simply refused to comply. This was an act of open defiance. Commentator Nahum Sarna claims, and I think he's correct, that this is very likely to be history's first recorded instance of civil disobedience in defense of a moral imperative. The text gives their contribution due weight by recording their names, Sifra and Pua. By contrast, the pharaoh of the oppression remains nameless. The final part of this drama, of course, is how the baby, the basket with the baby, the Bible calls it an ark, the same word used for the one built by Noah, how it comes into the hands of pharaoh's daughter, she hears the baby cry and is moved with compassion, not only to spare the child's life, but to adopt him as her own son. Her actions were perhaps the most remarkable of all. Her weapon against un the unjust state was her privilege as a daughter of the ruling elite. There isn't so much as a peep of protest or question about her decision. Apparently, whatever Pharaoh's daughter wants, Pharaoh's daughter gets. The contract with Moses' mother is also instructive. Contracts for a woman to nurse a child are attested from ancient times. The high infant mortality rate in the ancient world meant that these contracts went well beyond the time when a child could handle solid food. Moses would most likely have been several years old when he was returned to his adopted mother. The point I want to make here is that there is simply no way, given the setting of this story, that Moses was not known by everyone in the royal court as the biological child of Hebrew slaves. Moreover, Moses himself would most likely have known his own background. This kind of speculation, and I am definitely being speculative here, can get us off track by getting into historical details we can't verify and distract from the point of the story. In the Bible, history is not the point. Rather, it uses history or narratives to make its points. The point here is not to dismiss what the daughter of Pharaoh did as the whim of a court princess. Her act was bold and compassionate in equal measure. Her defiance is an excellent example of privilege turned to positive ends. We hear a lot these days about privilege, which can be defined as having options denied to others. Privilege means there are certain things you don't need to worry about simply because of who you are. It confers advantage, tilts the playing field. I think it's fair to say that the daughter of Pharaoh had privilege, and lots of it. The authors of scripture understood the dangers of overly concentrated, unaccountable power. The Bible spends a lot of time on the erosion and subversion of unjust power structures. The story of how just such a power structure was broken is a significant part of Israel's national narrative, and I believe this is significant. Consider that the stories of Moses' infancy describe a graded scale of tactics turned against injustice, subversive God, disobedience, and privilege. These women made trouble in the service of compassion, mercy, and justice to preserve the life of Moses, who himself was surely one of history's most prolific troublemakers. There is yet another way to read the actions of these women. 
Their willingness to resist was itself a sign that the Israelite people were ready to regain their freedom. There was a concept of time in the ancient world that acknowledged occasional moments when the cosmos functions differently. What was once unlikely or even impossible suddenly becomes possible, provided one acts with energy and decisiveness. Such major shifts do not happen according to a schedule. They happen when they happen, when the time is right. We cannot create them or predict when they will appear. The sudden surge in popularity and support for the Black Lives Matter movement seems to fit this model. I submit to you that we are living in such a moment when even modest acts against unjust systems have a disproportionately large effect. Even more than ever, this is a time for each of us to act in the service of justice and compassion. We may not have the privileges of a royal daughter, but there are plenty of ways to use our wits, our steadfastness, our privilege for the sake of others. Most of us do have some advantage, some skill, resources, or other advantage that we might not even realize we have. Consider your gifts. What you have that others do not. What you yourself can do, for lack of a better word, or get away with. Recently, our nation lost one of its civil rights icons, Representative John Lewis, who was among the original freedom riders who participated in many sit-ins, protests, and was arrested many times for his efforts to make voting available to every citizen. Addressing the nation's youth, he advised them to find a way to get in the way. Find a way to get into trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. May I suggest that this should apply to all of us, regardless of age. Let us set aside passiveness and complicity and embrace the Christian mandate to shape a new and better world. Amen. Shall we affirm our faith, saying words from the ancient church, the Apostles' Creed, found on page 5 in your bulletins, or on page 53 of our Book of Common Prayer? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy, Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Beloved, the Lord be with you, and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people 
gather together all our prayers, saying the general thanksgiving. That's on page 58 in our Book of Common Prayer, or on page 7 in the bulletins. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory, throughout all ages. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to offer our common supplication to thee. And you have promised through thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. And may the almighty and merciful Lord 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you now and always. Amen. Our closing hymn, The Church is One Foundation. In our hymnal, it's 525. In our bulletin, it is on page 7. 